Hello everybody, how are you going? Welcome to Non-Aussies of Reddit. What questions do you have about Australia? Something that I believe I'm well versed enough to answer and also quite curious to know what people want to know. How big a deal is skin cancer to you guys? Oh, we take it very seriously. Yeah. Slip slop slap and general sun safety is drilled into us since we are very young and there is also TVPS as to remind everyone of the dangers. Absolutely. There are many Australians who die of skin cancer every year and Queensland is the skin cancer capital of the world. Absolutely. This is my one main huge issue living in the UK. All my stupid British mates go and burn, tan themselves silly in 30 plus weather, or any slightly sunny day. Of course, the balmy army. This is why you all look leathery and old when you're 35. That is a honestly fair enough observation there, as... I mean, I guess they don't get that many sunny days, but man, they know how to take advantage of them or disadvantage of them when they do finally come out. Whereas in Australia, we still do have the highest skin cancer rate in the entire world, and I think then it's even New Zealand after us, perhaps. Either way, we are definitely number one. And then, like they said, Queensland topping the domestic charts, and that is just down to the fact that everyone is just going out in the sun. And even though they are apparently slip, slop, slap, seek, slide, I think that's what it's up to now, it's still to the fact that people just... I guess are in the sun so often and even if it's just an extra 15 minutes a day it can really add up into a major major big difference and then there's all the people that are just completely disregarded and so it's a big deal for a lot of people and a lot of people do do the correct thing but there's only so many people you're never going to get 100% and so when you're dealing with such high rates of UV it sadly quite quickly does become quite prevalent within the entire community. Do you live in perpetual fear of magpies? Magpies are super no. clever. If you mistreat them, they will recognize yes. you and inform their mates that you're dong when they see you next. That's you can hear true. them squawk it. Yeah. Oh, what are your Christmas so adverts clever. like? In the Northern Hemisphere, obviously, our Christmas adverts are all based around cozy fireplaces. Yep. Snow. Wrapping up warm. Hot chocolate. Oh. Sleighs. Randy's. ETC. But since you have Christmas in the middle of summer, what would a typical Australian Christmas advert look like to you? Oh. Does Coca-Cola do a separate advert for the sh- What about John Lewis? We have some brands that don't change their advertising, yeah, and some that cater to the classic Aussie Christmas of a summer barbecue with your family. Uh, it is a real mixture. There is a whole bundle of people that do like, even just people every day just dressing up their homes and whatnot, but people and advertising that do go ahead and convert it to a wintry theme, and I, everyone just kind of accepts it, because it is what it is. They understand where the traditions are coming from, and people like to kind of live out that fantasy that they're living in minus two degrees anyway, but then you have a whole bundle of other companies that just play right into it you basically if it's not snowing there's cricket involved is basically how it seems to be cricket or a lot of sun uh, water water slides or a slippery slide anything like that it's just going to be featured in these advertisements and i guess it really does depend on what kind of thing they're trying to sell for instance take the coca-cola ads that just has to be some of the easiest advertising in the world you go we have a massive christmas themed budget but then you also just get to have a hot summer day and a cold drink it, it's it has to be the easiest advertising in the world i mean i don't really know how they get around it having a cold drink on a cold day is that's not going to be too many people's favorites but pff, in australia it's just so easy and that kind of trend follows it up but then take another massive juggernaut, Maccas, they can just also have their summer sunny burgers and all those kind of things, where some people just don't need to bother. What are some interesting events of Australian history which the rest of okay. the world might not know? We up? lost a prime minister in the ocean and named a public pool after him. Yes. We had a prime minister and, dismissed okay. by the Queen through the Governor General and in general politics can be quite raucous here. We okay. were bombed by the Japanese in World War II. A nuclear okay. bomb is rumored to have been tested by a Japanese cult in a remote area, the sign of which was an unusual earthquake. But remote Australia was also used to test nukes. Old Harold Holt. My mum still thinks a Japanese submarine got him. I Whoa. pointed out how would they get a sub on the beach, but she said that's what they want you to think and apparently that's solved the issue. Of on the course. 17th of December 1966 Australian Prime Minister Harold Holt went for a swim in the ocean and never came back. There it is. It's presumed he drowned. It's just crazy in the fact that... I don't know of many other countries that would have had to experience something like this in terms of just a complete disappearance, not even like a JFK situation, no, just no one really knows where and how and what happened that day, it just never came back, never went back to the office, and so all of a sudden everyone just has to pick up the scraps and go, oh my goodness, we have to suddenly figure this out because we're missing our Prime Minister, our leader. And then of course, like they mentioned, there were so many different conspiracy theories or just general theories about what could have possibly happened to him, I'm sure that there has been alleged sightings all around the world of this guy, but realistically it doesn't matter. The fact was that he went for a swim one day, 
that's the last time he was ever presumed to be seen and then never came back never went back to office or anything like that so we'll just see what these people have to say about it but there is one thing in particular being the australian public just picked up on and ran with still to this day one of the ways we chose to honor him was by building a freaking swimming pool in his name. Which Another interesting crazy. historical event would be the reign of Ned Kelly, a beloved yet infamous bush ranger. Okay, well before they move on to Ned Kelly, it's just the fact that people say if someone disappears from a party or just generally anywhere, you can say that they are doing a halt, which is doing a Harold halt, which is just disappearing without notice. And that is an accepted colloquial use of this tragic event, but it's just a thing that happens as well. Either way, on to Ned Kelly. He is best known for a shootout with police in which he dressed himself up in thick iron yeah. armor, making him basically invincible to bullets. And very heavy. The biggest flaw in his armor is that he didn't cover his ankles. This was the weak spot police eventually shot at bringing him down. Crazy. He was then hanged for his actions. His famous last words were supposedly such as life. Just Freaking kangaroos. Do they scare you? Nah, they generally leave me alone. Yeah. Some of them get pretty ballsy when it comes to cars though. Kangaroos will yeah. either eat from your hand or disembowel you with a kick. <laughs> There's no in between. Choose wisely. Yeah. Oh yeah, kangaroos are some mean... Uh, I wouldn't say mean actually. Perhaps something more like misunderstood a lot of the time because people either expect one or the other where it could be one or the other in any one moment. They don't have to be always eating from your hand and especially when you throw in things like wallabies in there. Wallabies are a lot more docile than a lot of kangaroos may be where wallabies could come up to you and just eat from your hand a kangaroo i feel as though it's a little bit more likely just to run away for one or go into fight or flight mode and yes then they will just use their massive claws both on their front arms and paws and then their rear hind legs just to kick you to next uh, into oblivion basically the thing is that the big red kangaroos they are big to begin with but then once they stand on their tail and they just gain an extra half a meter or a foot and a half or whatever you want to be calling it they just become huge huge animals i'm sure people have seen plenty of images and things of these just ripped kangaroos as well they are so strong pretty darn smart as well just running away into dams and things on farms and then drowning animals be it dogs or whatever is chasing them because they can just stand up on their tail and just push them under the water there is so much of that stuff where they really are just in tune with the land but that is the thing there is generally no need to be approaching these animals and even if you do happen to stumble across one i mean you can say hello but i just don't really know if that entire interaction is going to go as you kind of presume it may and so just maybe just observe them from a distance for their incredible hops in saying all of that though i do believe that the most deadly form of kangaroo is actually going to be when people are kind of armored up inside their cars because you just have these packs of maybe 10 to 20 kangaroos and they're jumping along the side of the car and there is no knowing which way they're going to be going all of a sudden they just dart across you in a jump and there goes basically your entire car they can go through your windscreen they've taken people out in that regard people in canada say that they have the moose and yes moose are much bigger animals than kangaroos but they don't as far as i'm aware travel in the same pack sizes of kangaroos and they're not as random like just because of the way that a kangaroo moves and it's jumping and everything they are so quick to dart across even though they're running parallel they will get in front of you and just boom you seriously do have to be careful about it and if you can maybe just stop for a minute and let the kangaroos just disperse if that is going to be a plausible situation that is probably your best situation stop the car let them run away in whatever direction they need to and want to and then continue on your way and hope that they don't just follow you what are the most true and false stereotypes oh, most true we drink and swear tons least true sure. we have kangaroos hopping down city streets <laughs> The coast hey. of the country, which is where all our major cities are, is fairly urban and doesn't get much ruse. We have kangaroos hopping down city streets, <laughs> yes. launched in here. We have wallabies regularly on public roads less than 5 kilometers from the center of town. Yep. We know this, because the road kill is horrible. Yeah, How do you cope with the fact that if you want to visit any other place in the planet, it will be extremely expensive and take much longer than for everyone else? Do parents <sighs> save for their kids so that they can't take some time traveling and some sort of sabbatical? Really? Southeast Asian destinations are very popular. Bali, Vietnam, Fiji, Thailand, Vanuatu etc. And these are close and pretty cheap to visit. Really? Even flights to Japan are pretty cheap and don't take that long. Yeah, but yeah, US or Europe is long haul and pricey. Oh, yeah. The travel gap year thing isn't overly big here. Most teens use a gap year to work. Travel is more popular in that time between leaving university and having kids. So oh. mid-twenties into early thirties. I think our idea of don't take that long is very different but this is due to cultural differences. A non-stop mm. flight from Sydney to Tokyo takes between 9 to 11 hours. The longest that I flew was a 3 hours flight from Italy to Finland. Whoa. My dad has been to China and it took 12 hours getting there. D. What? 
Hang on a second. Ah, oh, that is what is going on here. That last one was from a non-Australian. That makes more sense though. But yes, that's what I was going to say is our idea of don't take that long is absolutely going to be different, especially compared to Europe. I mean, if you take a European perspective on anything compared to North America or Australia, the distances are just completely whack. Like, uh, there's no thousands of kilometers or barely even hundreds of kilometers measured in when you're talking traveling distances. You can pop between countries in hundreds of kilometers. Whereas if you were in, I mean, I was going to say Perth, but even in Sydney, you can not travel out of the state faster than you can travel to Scotland from Brighton, I believe is what it is. It's just it's just not even the same level. Where like this person said the longest flight they took was three hours. I, I mean, that's like the, basically the shortest flight you can take internationally in Australia. A lot of people, I'm surprised they didn't say travel to New Zealand. That is also a very popular destination that I think virtually every Australian ever has taken. And yeah, that's completely fine. New Zealand's a great place. I, everyone seems to love it as well. But yes, Bali, Vietnam, Fiji, absolutely, even maybe extending out to uh, New Caledonia, but a lot of people, I guess, take the cruise ships to get out there. So definitely places like Fiji are very, very popular because that's a relatively short haul flight overall. And then extending up to a more longer haul flight would be somewhere like Tokyo and Japan. And that's just because it's just straight up. You just go straight up in the same time zone and it's completely fine. Whereas as soon as you have to start crossing diagonally over to the west coast of the States or even just stopping over in Dubai, the flights just become so much longer and, like I said, so much more expensive. And I do find it interesting that the travel gap year thing isn't overly big here. Most teens use their gap year to work. That is an interesting perspective. I would say the opposite, that travel is more popular in the time of leaving university and having kids. Yeah, a lot of people do it, but I know plenty of people that just have been going overseas ever since they finished school and they're still at uni kind of thing. I mean, it definitely is not going to be a one size fits all kind of thing, but I know that there are plenty of people that both travel during uni, after uni, and also before uni. And maybe that's just because their parents may be helping them out. Maybe it's also down to the fact that some people are able to save because they had a job during school where some people also didn't. So that's coming into the equation. Regardless, to say that the travel gap you think isn't overly big here, I think is a bit of a lie. True. People expect that it's going to take longer to get places here. Okay. I did notice that when I was in Germany. When the people I was staying with said something was a bit of a drive they meant 20 minutes. Here what? a bit of a drive is like 2-4 hours. <laughs> yeah. But certainly Japan is a lot closer than the US or the UK. Absolutely. Have you ever met a strange lady who made you nervous, <laughs> took you in, and gave you breakfast? Yes. I told her I come from the land down under. Really? Where women glow and men plunder. That's the place. What is your favorite instrument and why is it the didgeridoo? Cause of the amazing okay. Nyomno sound. <laughs> Do women really glow and men really chunder? Oh yes. God, if going. by glow you mean drip with sweat. The chundering is real although it is a little bit of an outdated term you don't hear as much these days. It In means puking, right? Yeah. Yep. But we don't really use that term either through up and chucked are more common, at least in the state I'm from. Now look, I'll admit it, that was definitely something that caught me off guard from the other one as well, saying, have you ever met a strange lady who made you nervous, took you in and gave you breakfast? I don't believe so. Not, not in any capacity that I can remember them being strange at least. And I do think that it was kind of presumed that I came from the land down under. So I don't think I told her or I'd said anything like that. But no, the fact that people are even asking in this question, and it was basically two in a row, truly does start to show me what people really want to be knowing about Australia. And that is just the answer to all the questions and everything that is posed in Land Down Under song. And really, I guess if people just listen to all the lyrics in the song and not just that one line, they may also get a couple more answers out of it. So maybe just go and listen to the song. How do you handle the sun on a regular basis? I'm a pastor blonde living in the UK, and yeah. in the few days of intense sun we get in a year, I have to lather up so much sunscreen that I feel Good. like a greasy mess just to not get sunburned, and it's Fair just enough. such an inconvenience. One uh. of the main reasons I don't look for jobs in warmer climates is dealing with the sun. How the hell do you do it? What I've noticed as an Aussie living in Denmark is that Europeans will go out of the way to be in direct sunlight. <laughs> we really? generally will not sit in direct sunlight in the middle of the day. Our oh, UV exposure is higher than in Europe. Yeah, I know yeah, you're yeah. gonna hate the idea, but a wide brimmed hat, long sleeves and sit in the shade. Yep. The difference being we know the sun will be out tomorrow and don't have the need to make the most of the four days the sun is out in this part of the world. Interesting, interesting. The fact that people are just going out of their way to sit in the sun and literally lap up every ray of sunshine they can possibly get their skin on. Not even just their hands on, but their entire body of skin on. Makes sense if that's the kind of idea that you were trying to sit favorably in every single day that you possibly can because it is just always going to be, especially if you're going to be in Europe and not even going down to Spain or anything like that. But if you're just going into the UK, 
It just, the clouds, it really is just that simple. And so it makes sense that people are going out of their way to get every little bit of sunlight they can. But of course, then they're dealing with the consequences of that. And as they said here, and I was just going to say if they didn't say it, plenty of people do have as we already mentioned, a much more respectful attitude towards the sun. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are plenty of people that also don't, and I guess from that point of view, they do kind of live their life a lot more tanned because there is a lot more sun, and so there is nothing healthy about a tan, but they don't burn instantly because they've just been darker their entire life. Maybe that is also something that comes into it, but there are a lot more people that do wear a wider brimmed hat and long sleeves and long pants, nothing, not like puffer jackets, but just flannel shirt shirts and a Bunnings wide brim hat, all of those kind of things, just to be able to be in the sun and not fry instantly. Is Bunnings still successful down there? <laughs> I had the unfortunate pleasure of yes. working for them during their ill-fated attempt to bring the brand to the UK. It seemed like they hadn't the faintest idea how to run a company. Bunnings is how I knew to take Cora right. Admiral seriously. What? They stopped selling snags. It got real. Wow. Do you talk True. about New Zealand much? Cause we talk about our neighbors across the ditch at least once a week lol. We mainly just call them sheep frikers. How are we call you lot wannabe wankers over here smiley face. Hey, 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 hey. Look there is always going to be a bit of banter between two countries that are relatively so similar and even though New Zealand is just the scraps off the plate that Australia didn't want, at the same time I can't say that I've ever met a Kiwi that I hated. They are all generally nice people and they have a very very nice country as well. But in terms of saying just generally talking about them, unless we're making fun of them saying fush and chups or something like that, I wouldn't say that we talk about them much. In comparison we would absolutely be talking about Bunnings well more than New Zealand and that is just because Bunnings is an absolutely Australian staple in so many ways of the word like I literally just said before this came up the Bunnings hat the Bunnings umbrella that's another just fantastic one and then of course the Bunnings snags ah oh, the Bunnings really just is an epicenter of so much good in this world and it's amazing I've never heard that they tried to go to the UK it seemed like they hadn't the faintest idea of how to run a company I wonder if it was any different or what went wrong because I guess not many people have many good things to say about the staffing of Bunnings and generally no one has any idea about where anything is but in terms of just an epicenter like I said of uh, goodwill so to say people absolutely love it you'll find them there on a Saturday a Sunday a Wednesday night anything you need you'll just go to Bunnings for. You name things oddly. I had a friend okay. who lived there and she moved to Whoop Whoop. Ignorantly, I'm trying to figure it out on a map, and realized it was a nonsense term for middle of nowhere. Yeah. To the question, how is the food culture? You have a lot of cooler potential influences. Food here is amazing. Eating out is expensive though, so a lot of people learn to cook at home. Yep. If you ever watch Aussie Master Chef, you'll see that the level that they operate on is very high. That's okay. mostly because of how good most people are at just a base level. Okay. To be honest, I can't exactly say that I have any comparison between watching Australian MasterChef and any international MasterChef. I haven't even watched the Australian one, I would say, at that regard. But <laughs> the fact that people are saying that they name things oddly here and then talking about whoop whoop, that is, uh, that is not something that I expected to be coming up today. But it also does make sense. There are plenty of terms like any country in the world that people are just not going to be able to really determine what they are unless you know. Like saying, yeah, I moved to whoop whoop means that you've moved to the middle of nowhere. You're not going to be able to find Whoop Whoop. Oh, actually, maybe you can. But it's very, very difficult to find a place called Whoop Whoop, especially if someone just says, oh, I moved seven hours out of Sydney into Whoop Whoop. That would go, oh, okay. And you're trying to look at about maybe 800k out or something like that. And you, you won't find it, that's for sure. In terms of the food culture, though, I do believe that Australia turns out some pretty high-end food. And I think that comes down to the base ingredients being of a pretty high standard. I mean, I've even, let's say, comparing to... USA eggs, for instance. I mean, you hear people that, wow, these eggs are so orange, these eggs are so golden compared to being yellow, and as far as I was ever concerned, that's what an egg was meant to be. But when you're comparing it to these overly manufactured, so to say, eggs from other countries, no wonder you're going to be having a better experience if you have better ingredients. And I think that comes into it a lot. In regards to having the cool potential influences, though, that is absolutely another factor that could come into it, having all of Southeast Asia and China and India just at our doorstep relative to the rest of the world does make a difference. And then we also have high migration of uh, Greek and Italian culture that obviously brought the coffee scene and so many other things like that. There is a real mixing pot and mosaic of people that have moved here and that does allow a, a very broad food culture, I would say. 
Is Steve Irwin somewhat of a national hero to you? He certainly was the childhood hero for many across the world. Absolutely. He is bigger in the US in many ways than here, but Australia is also generally more low-key about celebrity. Yeah. The zoo is a big tourist attraction in Queensland, but quite expensive for your average Australian. Yeah. Absolutely. Steve Irwin is a national treasure. Yeah. May he rest in peace. I think these two words here sum that entire thing up perfectly. The fact is that he wasn't a celebrity in the fact that the US treated him like a celebrity or the US treats Tom Cruise as a celebrity or anything like that. He was a national icon and a true local hero, so to say, more so than a celebrity from an Australian point of view. Everyone just knew what he was about, knew what he was trying to accomplish and absolutely appreciated his expertise and his general demeanor when it came to approaching all of these animals and the education of, about the entire animal ecosystem. But he wasn't deemed to be as much of a celebrity in the same way because yes, people watched the show, but I think he took off in a way in other countries and became a celebrity. Whereas here, like they said, Australia is also generally more low key about celebrities. And I would say that in general, you know, even just the fact that What's his name? Um, Zac Efron, and there's a bundle of celebrities have moved to Australia for, I believe, that kind of reason. People, depending on who you are, but I think they just have a more low-key attitude. They, not that they don't care, but they maybe don't bother you as much. I mean, there are plenty of examples that I'm sure people could pull out where people <laughs> and celebrities have been bothered to a major degree, but I don't know. I feel as though people just, they, they treat people differently, and that's as simple as that. And so Steve Irwin, absolute national treasure may he rest in peace and just be remembered for all eternity for what he was able to accomplish in the same way that someone like david Attenborough is he a celebrity in the uk i guess but is he also just a national icon and treasure and worldwide hero yeah i think i think these kind of guys are in the same category they're almost above celebrity they, they're true heroes what would you say is the biggest problem in australia right now excluding the virus obviously okay. the government being controlled by big coal companies it's Ooh. a pain in the ass the population being misinformed by the government and media sad face yes damn shame people don't fact check what they read here wow is it true you guys <laughs> really have like everything that can kill you there if you're careful the wildlife isn't a problem if you go into some parts with no right. equipment, experience, knowledge, you will get fricked up by a snake or jellyfish. <laughs> Absolutely. Or a spider, for goodness sake, and not a big spider. Everyone always worries about the big spiders. It's the little spiders, be it the redbacks, for instance, that you have to watch out for because, yeah, they might look a little bit scary. I would say that a redback looks dangerous, but... It doesn't look threatening from a big fluffy spider kind of tarantula point of view. No, 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 no. Redbacks will be in your boot till the end of time and then wait for your foot just to protect themselves but then bite you and you will know about it. You will maybe not know about it if you take too long kind of thing. And of course the same thing also goes for snake and jellyfish and blue ringed octopuses. I just want to put a little asterisk in there as well. Don't be touching anything that is blue. Blue is just nature's way of going, rack off. We are blue, we are poisonous, don't touch us. The fact that I've seen someone handling a blue ringed octopus as well as some other jellyfish like box jellyfish, they will mess up your entire life, literally ending it, as well as snakes, of course, like brown snakes. That's probably the most common one that you're going to be having a problem with, red belly blacks. So you have red backs and red belly blacks. Don't mess with anything in that regard. So yeah, <clears throat> wildlife isn't a problem if you don't mess with it and you know what to look out for. But uh, I would say that 99% of tourists never will even encounter any of these things because they don't look enough and they're not here for long enough. Was the emu war real? Yeah, yes. jokes aside, it, it actually was. It's the story crazy. is that emus were eating famous as crops, which was causing a massive food shortage. So they sent in armed people to cull the emu. They used 10 rounds for one emu kill which was a massive waste of time and resources. So... We consider it a win for the emu. Absolutely. I think it was in the 1930s. Yeah, all spot on info. Ridiculous. Why are your women so beautiful? I watch MasterChef okay. season 11 every weeknights and I just can't take my eyes off Nicole Scott. As an Aussie okay. woman flips hair seductively it is just natural beauty. You only see the model ones though. Some of my cousins look like the south end of a northbound wombat. My sill is oh. built like a brick at house. Then again my bros have always gone for meteor women who could out arm wrestle the hulk. Maybe survival <laughs> okay. of the fittest? Some of us prefer death by snoo snoo. Look, I feel as though this last question is going to be a little bit subjective and a little bit of a personal preference kind of thing, but for the poor sister that was talked about, like the south end of a northbound wombat, that is 
That is brutal. I don't want to be that sibling. Regardless, I've also learned that apparently Australian MasterChef has gone international. I didn't believe that that would be a thing. But hey, if someone is watching from the UK or the US watching Australian TV, more the merrier. Why not jump on board for whatever reason you might be watching it? Also, the fact that the emu war was in fact real. I'd forgotten the specifics of the entire thing using 10 rounds for one emu kill was a massive waste of time and resources would absolutely be a true fact. There is no way when you're trying to cull millions then you can afford billions of rounds of ammunition. We're well, not the USA for goodness sake, we can't just have those kind of budgets, but it's also the 1930s and so I think if something now was to be put into action, you would hope that they wouldn't lose the emu war. I feel as though there may be a few different ways they would go about it, but in terms of accuracy, surely Compared to the 1930s, almost 100 years later, we might be able to beat the emus. But who knows? The emus have so many different tricks up their sleeve. They have numbers on their side. And they have vast, vast, sprawling landscapes for them to run around in. That truly, I don't know if even these days we would be able to win that war. The fact is that farmers and everyone else tried their best. But uh, Australia always finds a way. Natural Australia always finds a way to win the war.